Book One, Chapter Twenty Five of Black George the Smith and How He Threw the Hammer. The Bull is a plain square whitewashed building with a sloping roof, and before the door an open portico, wherein are set two seats on which one may sit of a sunny afternoon with a mug of ale at one's elbow, and watch the winding road, the thatched cottages bowered in roses, or the quiver of distant trees where the red conical roof of some oast house makes a vivid note of colour amid the green or one may close one's eyes and hark to the chirp of the swallows under the eaves the distant lowing of cows or the clink of hammers from the smithy across the way and presently as we sat there drowsing in the sun to us came one from the tap a bullet-headed fellow small of eye and nose but great of jaw albeit he was become somewhat fat and fleshy who having nodded to me sat him down beside the ancient and addressed him as follows black george be took again gaffer ah i knowed twould come sooner or late simon said the ancient shaking his head i knowed as he'd never last the month out seemed going on all quiet and regular though said the bullet-headed man whom i discovered to be the landlord of the bull seemed nice and quiet and nothing out of the way when bout an hour ago it were he ups and eaves sam out into the road ah said the old man nodding his head again to be sure i've noticed simon as tis generally about the twentieth of the month his charge gets took eve got a wonderful head of the gaffer said simon turning to me yes said i but who is black george and how comes he to be taken and by what gaffer said the innkeeper you tell him <laughs> why then began the ancient nothing loath black george be a girt big strong man the biggest girtest and strongest in the south country do you see almost as fine a man as i were in my time and off and on gets took with terrans and rages at which times he don't mind who he it's no nor where added the innkeeper oh he be a bad man be black george when he's took for he have a knack do you see of taking hold of the one nice turn and even an over his head extremely unpleasant said i just what he done this morning with sam nodded the innkeeper hoven out into the road he did and what did sam do i inquired oh sam are mighty glad to get off so easy sam must be a very remarkable fellow undoubtedly a philosopher said i he be naught to look at said the ancient now at this moment there came a sudden deep bellow a hoarse bull-like roar from somewhere near by and looking round in some perplexity through the wide doorway of the smithy opposite i saw a man come tumbling all arms and legs who having described a somersault fell rolled over once or twice and sitting up in the middle of the road stared about him in a dazed sort of fashion that's job nodded the ancient poor fellow said i and rose to go to his assistance oh that were nothing said the ancient laying a restraining hand upon my arm oh, nothing at all job bein't hurt why i've seen him fall further nor that afore now but ye see job be pretty heavy handlin even for black george and in a little while job arose from where he sat in the dust and limping up sat himself down on the opposite bench very black of brow and fierce of eye and after he had sat there silent for maybe five minutes i said that i hoped he wasn't hurt hurt he repeated with a blank stare how should i be hurt why you seem to fall rather heavily said i at this job regarded me with a look half resentful half reproachful and immediately turned his back upon me from which and sundry winks and nods and shakes of the head from the others it seemed that my remark had been ill-judged and after we had sat silent for maybe another five minutes the ancient appeared to notice job's presence for the first time why you be at workin's afternoon then job 
he inquired solemnly. No. Going to take holiday, perhaps. Ah, I'm done with smithin', leastways for Black George. And him with all that raft o' work in, Job? Pretty fix he'll be in, with no one to strike for him, said Simon. Sarves and right, too, retorted Job, furtively rubbing his left knee. But what'll he do without a helper? persisted Simon. Hey, Lord knows, returned the ancient, unless Job thinks better of it. Not me, said the individual, feeling his right elbow with tender solicitude. I'm done with Black George, I am. Ain't I broke my back for me once afore, but this is a last time. I never swing a sledge for Black George again, danged if I do. And him to mound the old church screen up to Cranbrook Church, sighed the ancient. A wonderful screen, a wonderful screen. Older than me. <laughs> ah, a sight older. Hundreds and hundreds of years older. They wouldn't let nobody touch it but Black George. He be the best smith in the South Country, nodded Simon. Eh, and a bad man to work for as ever was, growled Job. I'll work for them no more. My mind's made up. And when my mind's made up, there beant no movin' me. Like a rock I be. "'Twould a been a fine thing for a sissonest man to have mended to old screen," said the ancient. "'Twould that,' nodded Simon, "'a shame it is, as it should go to others.' Hereupon, having finished my ale, I rose. "'Be you a-goin', young mister?' inquired the ancient. "'Why, that depends,' said I. "'I, I understand this man, Black George, needs a helper, so I have decided to go and offer my services. You! exclaimed Job, staring in open-mouthed amazement, as did also the other two. Why not? I rejoined. Black George needs a helper, and I need money. My chap, said Job warningly, don't you do it. You be a tidy, sizable chap, but Black George would make no more of you than I should of a baby. Don't you do it. "'Better not,' said Simon. "'On the contrary,' I returned. "'Better run a little bodily risk and satisfy one's hunger, "'rather than lie safe but famishing beneath some hedge or rick. "'What do you think, Ancient?' "'The old man leaned forward and peered up at me sharply beneath his hanging brows. "'Well?' said I. "'You am right,' he nodded. "'And a man with eyes that like a yearn beant one as tis easy to turn aside, "'even though it do be Black George's tries.' "'Then,' said Job, as I took up my staff, "'if your back's broke, my chap, why don't go for to blame me, that's all. "'You'll be a sight too cocksure, ah, that you be.' "'I'm thinking Black George would find this chap a bit different to Job,' remarked the ancient. "'What's it you think, Simon?' It looks as if he might take a good blow, ah, uh, and give one for that matter, returned the innkeeper, studying me with half-closed eyes and his head to one side, as I have seen artists look at pictures. He be pretty wide in the shoulders, and full in the chest, and, by the look of him, quick on his pins. You've been a fighting man, Simon, and you ought to know, but he've got some it better still. And what might that be, gaffer? inquired the innkeeper. A good straight bright eye, Simon, with a look in it as says, I will. <laughs> ah, but what a charge, cried Job. Black charge don't mind a man's eyes, except to black frequent. He don't mind nothing or nobody. That Job, said the ancient, tapping his snuff-box. There's some things as is better nor girt, big muscles and girt strong fists. If you wasn't a danged fool, you'd know what I mean. Young man, he went on, turning to me, you puts me in mind of what I were at your age, though to be sure I were taller than you by about five or six inches, or maybe more. But don't go for to be too cocksure for all that. Black jars aren't to be sneezed at. And if you must hitten, added the innkeeper, why, go for the chin. There aren't a better place to it a man than on the chin, if so be you can thump it right, and ard enough. I mind to so I put out Tom Brock a Bedford. A sweet pretty blow it were too, 
though I do say it. Thank you, said I. Should it come to fighting, which heaven forfend, I shall certainly remember your advice. Saying which, I turned away, and crossed the road to the open door of the smithy, very conscious of the three pairs of eyes that watched me as I went. Upon the threshold of the forge I paused to look about me, and there, sure enough, was the smith. <laughs> Indeed a fine big fellow he was, with great shoulders and a mighty chest, and arms whose bulging muscles showed to advantage in the red glow of the fire. In his left hand he grasped a pair of tongs wherein was set a glowing iron scroll, upon which he beat with a hammer in his right. I stood watching until, having beaten out the glow from the iron, he plunged the scroll back into the fire and fell to blowing with the bellows. But now, as I looked more closely at him, I almost doubted if this could be Black George after all, for this man's hair was of bright gold, and curled in tight rings upon his brow, while, instead of the black scowling visage I had expected, I beheld a ruddy, open, well-featured face, out of which looked a pair of eyes of a blue you may sometimes see in a summer sky at evening. And yet again his massive size would seem to proclaim him the famous Black George, and no other. It was with something of doubt in my mind, nevertheless, that I presently stepped into the smithy and accosted him. "'Are you Black George?' I inquired. At the sound of my voice he let go the handle of the bellows and turned. As I watched I saw his brows draw suddenly together, while the golden hairs of his beard seemed to curl upward. "'Suppose I be!' "'Then I wish to speak with you.' "'Be that what you am come for?' "'Yes.' "'Be you come far?' "'Yes.' "'That's a pity.' "'Why?' "'Cause you'll have a good way to go back again.' "'What do you mean?' Well, for one thing, I mean as I don't like your looks, my chap. And why don't you like my looks? Lord, exclaimed the smith, how should I know? But I don't. Of that I'm certain sure. Which reminds me, said I, of a certain unpopular gentleman of the name of Fell or Pell or Snell. Eh? said the smith, staring. There is a verse, I remember, which runs, I think, in this wise. I do not love thee, Dr. Fell, or Pell, or Snell, for reasons which I cannot tell. But this I know, and know full well, I do not love thee, Dr. Fell, or Pell, or Snell. So you am a poet, eh? No, said I, shaking my head. Then I'm sorry for it. A man don't meet with poets every day. Saying which, he drew the scroll from the fire and laid it glowing upon the anvil. You was wishful to speak with me, I think? he inquired. Yes, I answered. Ah, oh, nodded the smith, to be sure, and forthwith began to sing most lustily, marking the time very cleverly with his ponderous hand-hammer. If, I began a little put out at this, if you will listen to what I have to say. But he only hammered away harder than ever, and roared his song the louder, and though it sounded ill enough at the time, it was a song I, I came to know well later, the words of which are these. Strike, ding, ding, strike, ding, ding, the iron it glows, and loveth good blows. As fire doth bellows, strike, ding, ding. Now, seeing he was determined to give me no chance to speak, I presently seated myself close by and fell to singing likewise. <laughs> Oddly enough, the only thing I could recall on the moment was the tinker's song, and that but very imperfectly. And it served my purpose well enough. Thus we fell to it with a will, with the different notes clashing and filling the air with a most vile discord, and the words all jumbled up together, something in this wise. Strike, ding, ding, a tinker I am, ho! Oh. Strike, ding, ding, a tinker am I. The iron it glows, a tinker I live, 
and to love with good blows and a tinker i'll die as fire doth bellows if the king in his crown strike ding ding would change places with me strike ding ding and so forth the louder he roared the louder roared i until the place fairly rang with the din insomuch that chancing to look through the open doorway i saw the ancient with simon job and several others on the opposite side of the way staring open mouth as well they might but still the smith and i continued to howl at each other with unabated vigour until he stopped all at once and threw down his hammer with a clang dang me if i like that voice o' yourn he exclaimed why to be sure i don't sing very often i answered which i mean to say is a very good thing oh a very good thing nor do i pretend to sing then why do you try now for company's sake well i don't like it i've had enough of it then said i suppose you listen to what i have to say not by no manner of means then what do you propose to do why said the smith rising and stretching himself since you ax me i'm a-goin to pitch you out on yon door you may try of course said i measuring the distance between us with my eye but if you do seeing you are so much the bigger and stronger man i shall certainly fetch you a knock with this staff of mine which i think you will remember for many a day so saying i rose and stepped out into the middle of the floor black george eyed me slowly up from the soles of my boots to the crown of my hat and down again picked up his hammer in an undecided fashion looked it over as if he had never seen such a thing before tossed it into a corner and seating himself on the anvil folded his arms all at once a merry twinkle leapt into the blue depths of his eyes and i saw the swift gleam of a smile what do you want man said he now hereupon with a sudden gesture i pitched my staff out through the open doorway into the road and folded my arms across my chest even as he why did he do that he inquired staring because i don't think i shall need it after all but suppose i was to come for you now but you won't you'll be a strange sort of chap said he shaking his head <laughs> so they tell me and what does the likes of you want with the likes of me work know anything about smithing not a thing <laughs> then why do you come here to learn more fool you said the smith why because smithing is hard work and dirty work and hot work and work as is badly paid nowadays then why are you a smith my father was a smith afore me and is that your only reason my only reason then you are the greater fool you think so do ye certainly supposin said black george stroking his golden beard reflectively supposin i was to get up and break your neck for that then you would at least save me from the folly of becoming a smith i don't said black george shaking his head no i do not like you i am sorry for that because he went on you've got the gift of the gab and a gabbing man is worse than a gabbing woman you can gab your share if it comes to that said i can i you can my chap he growled holding up a warning hand go easy now go easy don't get me took again not if i can help it i returned i be a quiet soul till i gets took a very quiet soul lambs being quieter but i won't answer for that neck o yon if i do get took so look out i understand you have an important piece of work on hand said i changing the subject the old church screen yes and are in need of a helper ah to be sure but you aren't got the look of a workin cove i never see a workin cove with hands like yourn so white as a woman's they be i have worked hard enough in my time nevertheless said i what might you have done now i have translated petronius arbiter 
also Quintilian, with a literal rending into the English of the memories of the Sieur de Branton. Oh, exclaimed the smith, that sounds a lot. Anything more? Oh, yes, I answered. I won the high jump and throwing the hammer. Throwing the hammer? repeated Black George, musingly. Was it anything like that there? And he pointed to a sledge nearby. Something, I answered. And you want work? I do. Tell you what, my fellow, if you can throw that there hammer further nor me, then I say done, and you can name your own wages. But if I beat you, and I'm fair sure I can, then you must stand up to me for ten minutes, and I'll give it a good trouncing to ease my mind. What do you say? After a momentary hesitation, I nodded my head. Done, said I. <laughs> <laughs> More fool you, grinned the smith, and catching up his sledgehammer, he strode out into the road. Before the bowl, a small crowd had gathered, all newly come from field or farmyard, for most of them carried rake or pitchfork, having doubtless been drawn thither by the hellish outcry of Black George and myself. Now I noticed that while they listened to the ancient, who was holding forth, snuff-box in hand, yet every eye was turned towards the smithy, and in every eye was expectation. At our appearance, however, I thought they seemed, one and all, vastly surprised and taken aback, for heads were shaken and glances wandered from the smith and myself to the ancient and back again. "'Well, I'll be danged!' exclaimed Job. "'I knowed it! I knowed it!' cried the ancient, rubbing his hands and chuckling. "'Knowed what, Gaffer?' inquired Black George, as we came up. "'Why, I knowed as this young chap would come out a walkin' upon his own two legs, and not like Job, a rollin' and a wallerin' in the dust of the road, like a hog.' "'Why, you see, Gaffer,' began the smith, almost apologetically, it seemed to me, it do come sort of natural to heave the likes of Job about a bit. You know, Job's made for it, you might say. But this chap's different. So he be, Charge, so he be, nodded the ancient. Though mark me, Gaffer, I aren't no how in love with this chap neither. He gabs too much to suit me by a long sight. He do that, chimed in Job, edging nearer. What I says is, if he do get his back broke, he aren't got nobody to blame but hisself, so cock sure as he be. Job, said the ancient, hold the tongue. I says he's a cock sure cove, repeated Job doggedly. And a cock sure cove he be. What do you think, George? Job, returned the smith, I don't chuck a man into the road and talk with him both on the same day. In this conversation I bore no part, busying myself in drawing out a wide circle in the dust, a proceeding watched by the others with much interest, and not a few wondering comments. "'What be going to do with the hammer, George?' inquired the ancient. "'Why,' explained the smith, "'this chap thinks he can throw it further nor me.' At this there was a general laugh. "'If so be he can,' pursued Black George, then he comes to work for me at his own price. But if I beat him, then he must stand up to me with his fists for ten minutes. Ten minutes? cried a voice. He won't last five. See if he do. Feel sorry for him, said a second. He do be so pale as a sheet already. So would you be if you was in his shoes, chimed a third, whereat there was a general laugh. Indeed, as I looked round the ring of grinning, unresponsive faces, it was plain to see that all sympathy was against the stranger, as is the way of bird, beast, fish, but especially man, the world over. And I experienced a sudden sense of loneliness, which was, I think, only natural. Yet, as I put up my hand to loose the strap of my knapsack, I encountered another already there, and, turning, beheld Simon the innkeeper. "'If it do come to fightin,' he whispered close in my ear, "'if it do come to fightin, and I'm fair sure it will, "'keep away as much as you can. "'You look quick on your pins. "'Moreover, 
whatever you do watch is right and when you do see a chance to strike go for his chin a little to one side and strike dang hard many thanks for your friendly advice said i with a grateful nod and slipping off my coat would have handed it to him but that the ancient hobbled up and taking it from me folded it ostentatiously across his arm mark my words simon said he this young chap is as like what i were at his age as one pea is to another i says so and i mean so come said black george at this juncture i've work waiting to be done and my forge fire will be out i'm quite ready said i stepping forward it was now arranged that standing alternately within the circle we should each have three throws whoever should make the two best throws to win whereupon the smith took his place within the circle hammer in hand wait said i the advantage usually lies with the last thrower it would be fairer to you were we to toss for it no answered black george motioning the onlookers to stand back i've got the hammer and i'll throw first now as probably everyone knows it is one thing to swing a sledge-hammer in the ordinary way but quite another to throw at any distance for there is required beside the bodily strength a certain amount of knowledge without which a man is necessarily handicapped thus despite my opponent's great strength of arm i was fairly sanguine of the result black george took a fresh grip upon the hammer shaft twirled it lightly above his head swung it once twice thrice and let it go with a shout job and two or three others ran down the road to mark where it had fallen and presently returned pacing out the distance fifty-nine they announced can he beat that inquired black george complacently i think i can i answered as taking up the hammer i in turn stepped into the ring gripping the shaft firmly i whirled it aloft and began to swing it swifter and swifter gaining greater impetus every moment till like a flash it flew from my grasp panting i watched it rise 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 and then plunge down to earth in a smother of dust you've beat it cried the ancient flourishing his stick excitedly lord love me you've beat it i have beat it surely said a man who carried a rake that was forever getting in everybody's way and by a goodish bit too shouted another ah but george ain't got his arm in yet retorted a third charge can do better nor that by a long sight but now all voices were hushed as job paced up eighty-two he announced black george looked hard at me but without speaking stepped sulkily into the ring moistened his palms looked at me again and seizing the hammer began to whirl it as he had seen me round and round it went faster and faster till with a sudden lurch he hurled it up and away indeed it was a mighty throw straight and strong it flew describing a wide parabola ere it thudded into the road the excitement now waxed high and many started off to measure the distance for themselves shouting one to another as they went as for the smith he stood beside me whistling and i saw that the twinkle was back in his eyes again one hundred and twenty cried half a dozen voices and a half corrected job thrusting the hammer into my hand and grinning can he beat that inquired black george again ay can he beat that echoed the crowd it was a marvellous throw said i shaking my head and indeed in my heart i knew i could never hope to equal much less beat such a mighty cast i therefore decided on strategy and with this in mind proceeded in a leisurely fashion once more to mark out the circle which was obliterated in places to flatten the surface underfoot to roll up my sleeves and tighten my belt in fine i observed all such precautions as a man might be expected to take before some supreme effort at length having done everything i could think of to impress this idea upon the onlookers i took up the hammer 
means to do it this time cried the man with the rake knocking off job's hat in his excitement as with a tremendous swing i made my second throw there was a moment's breathless silence as the hammer hurtled through the air then like an echo to its fall came a shout of laughter for the distance was palpably far short of the giant smith's last a moment later job came pacing up and announced eighty-seven hereupon arose a very babble of voices you got em beat already george well i knowed it from the start let em alone cried simon you've got another chance yet much good it'll do him ah might as well give in now and take his thrashin and ad done with it that my ruse had succeeded with the crowd was evident they to a man believed i had done my best and already regarded me as hopelessly beaten my chance of winning depended upon whether the smith deluded into a like belief should content himself with just beating my last throw for should he again exert his mighty strength to the uttermost i felt that my case was indeed hopeless it was with a beating heart therefore that i watched him take his place for the last throw his face wore a confident smile but nevertheless he took up the hammer with such a business-like air that my heart sank and feeling a touch upon my arm i was glad to turn away i be goin to fetch a sponge and water said simon <laughs> a sponge and water ah likewise some vinegar there's nothing like vinegar and remember the chin a little to one side preferred so then you think i shall be beaten why i don't say that but it's best to be prepared aren't it now and with a friendly nod the innkeeper turned away in that same minute there arose another shout from the crowd as they greeted black george's last throw and job striding up announced ninety-eight then while the air still echoed with their plaudits i stepped into the ring and catching up the hammer swung it high above my head and at the full length of my arms began to wheel it the iron spun faster and faster till setting my teeth with the whole force of every fibre every nerve and muscle of my body i let it fly the blood was throbbing at my temples and my breath coming fast as i watched its curving flight and now all voices were hushed so that the ring of the iron could be plainly heard as it struck the hard road and all eyes watched job as he began pacing towards us as he drew nearer i could hear him counting to himself thus ninety-one ninety-two ninety-three ninety-four ninety-five ninety-six ninety-seven ninety-eight ninety-nine one hundred one hundred and one one hundred and two one hundred and two next moment as it seemed to me an inarticulate ancient was desperately trying to force me into my coat wrong side first and simon was shaking my hand you tricked me cried a voice and turning i found black george confronting me with clenched fists and how did i trick you i could a chucked father nor that well, then why didn't you because i thought you was beat i say you trick me and i tell you the match was a fair one from start to finish put up your hands said the smith advancing in a threatening manner no said i a bargain is a bargain and turning my back upon him i fell to watching the man with the rake who not content with job's word was busily pacing out the distance for himself put up your hands repeated black george hoarsely for the last time no said i over my shoulder strike me if you will i went on seeing him raise his fist i shall not defend myself but i tell you this black george the first blow you strike will brand you coward and no honest man coward is it cried he and with the word had seized me in a grip that crushed my flesh and nigh swung me off my feet coward is it he repeated yes said i 
none but a coward would attack an unresisting man so for a full minute we stood thus staring into each other's eyes and once again i saw the hairs of his golden beard curl up and outwards what would have been the end i cannot say but there came upon the stillness the sound of flying footsteps the crowd was burst asunder and a girl stood before us a tall handsome girl with raven hair and great flashing black eyes oh you george think shame on yourself think shame on yourself black george look she cried pointing a finger at him look at the great strong man as he's a coward i felt the smith's grip relax his arms dropped to his sides while a deep red glow crept upon his cheeks till it was lost in the clustering curls of gleaming yellow hair why prue he began in a strangely altered voice and stopped the fire was gone from his eyes as they rested upon her and he made a movement as though he would have reached out his hand to her but checked himself why prue he said again but choked suddenly and turning away strode back towards his forge without another word on he went looking neither to right nor left and i thought there was something infinitely woebegone and pitiful in the droop of his head now as i looked from his forlorn figure to the beautiful flushed face of the girl i saw her eyes grow wonderfully soft and sweet and brim over with tears and when black george had betaken himself back to his smithy she also turned and crossing swiftly to the inn vanished through its open doorway she've a fine spirit and that daughter o yourn simon oh a fine spirit he ever was chuckled the ancient prue art a fear to black george never was returned simon she could manage en allus could you'll mind she could allus tame black george with a look gaffer <laughs> ah she am a granddaughter to be proud on be prue nodded the ancient and proud i be too what said i is she your daughter simon ay for sure and your granddaughter ancient ay <laughs> that she be that she be why then simon must be your son <laughs> son as ever was nodded the old man and a goody shoddy be too oh i've seen worse and now added simon come in and you shall taste as fine a jug of ale as there be in all kent wait said the old man laying his hand upon my arm i've took to you young chap took to you amazing what might your name be peter i answered a good name a fine name nodded the old man peter <laughs> simon said he glancing from one to the other of us simon peter minds me of the disciple of our blessed lord it do a fine name be peter so peter i became to him thenceforth and to the whole village end of section ten